everyone. Welcome to this week's episode of Did Shakespeare. My name is Cassidy Cash, that Shakespeare girl. This week, we're going to be wrapping up our course on Shakespeare and mythological creatures by taking a look at the Sphinx. Did Shakespeare write about the Sphinx? <laughs> Shakespeare does indeed use the word sphinx in one of his plays, but as far as I could find, there was only one place where he actually used the word sphinx. It shows up in Love's Labor's Lost, and it is part of this big courtly love speech that's going on in the middle of the play. Now, Shakespeare is applying the word sphinx according to one definition of the word sphinx, which means an enigmatic person, someone of mystery, right? Well, this definition of a sphinx or a sphinx-like person being an enigma comes from Greek mythology. In Sophocles' tale of Oedipus the king, there is a sphinx that shows up and challenges travelers on their way to Thebes. Oedipus is on his way to Thebes, and he gets encountered by this sphinx who shows up and tells him a riddle. Oedipus is able to solve the riddle successfully and ultimately ends up dying anyway, and it's a massive tale about morality and humanity and success and failure, but the famous part that Shakespeare seems to be invoking when he says, has Berwyn say, subtle as a sphinx in Love's Labor's Lost is the idea of being a teller of Riddlers, something that must be figured out. Now, I wanted to look into exactly what was the culture surrounding the Sphinx during the 16th century, and it turned out to be a much more difficult investigation than any of our other mythical creatures we've covered in the course up to this point. So let's just dive right in with here's what I know. A sphinx is a mythical creature with the head of a human and the body of a lion. The most famous depiction of this that you have probably already heard of is the Great Sphinx of Giza. This was built thousands and thousands of years before William Shakespeare, and it is in Egypt. It's the most famous version of the sphinx, but it's not the only one. Francis Bacon, who was a philosopher and scientist, he's credited in the scientific method and influencing the scientific revolution, he was really popular during Shakespeare's lifetime. Francis Bacon served as general counsel to Queen Elizabeth, and he was the first person to be given that designation. And in 1597, he served as Elizabeth I's legal advisor. Later, under King James... Bacon became knighted. He was given an official knighthood by James I. This guy wrote up a description of a sphinx that dates to within Shakespeare's lifetime, and here's what he has to say. A sphinx was a monster combining many shapes into one. She had the face and voice of a virgin, the wings of a bird, the claws of a griffin. She dwelt on the ridge of a mountain near Thebes and infested the roads, lying in ambush for travelers whom she would suddenly attack and lay hold of. And when she had mastered them, she propounded to them certain dark and perplexed riddles which she thought was to have obtained from the muses. And if the wretched captives could not at once solve and interpret the same, as they stood hesitating and confused, she cruelly tore them to pieces. Now, obviously, he goes on to elaborate about the Sphinx being an allegory for science, and he outlines how this all connects back to science, which, of course, is Francis Bacon's wheelhouse. You can read his full description in the link to his work that I've placed in today's show notes, and the link to the show notes is right below the video. Interestingly, it would be another famous scientist, Isaac Asimov, who would use history to try and pinpoint when Love's Labor's Lost was written. And Love's Labor's Lost is the only play where the word Sphinx appears. And so I looked into this. Isaac Asimov, in Asimov's Guide to Shakespeare, delivers a criticism of all the allusions in Love's Labor's Lost to outline all of the history with Henry of Navarre and England's relationship with France and how, you know, Henry IV came to be Henry IV and all of these things. And Asimov specifically cites the line that Berwyn is speaking about the Sphinx and uses that passage to suggest that this is definitive proof that the play is all about courtly love. It's very elaborate. Asimov goes into great detail, and it is personally very fun for me as an Asimov fan to know that Asimov also liked Shakespeare. Ultimately, Asimov's analyzation of history and the play itself, it was Asimov's opinion that Love's Labor's Lost was written around 1593. Now, Asimov also said that Navarre was not a real place, so take all of this with a grain of salt. According to 
the definition of a sphinx being this enigmatic personality, Asimov is correct that Barun is applying this word in context of courtly love. He's talking about someone being a riddle or someone to be figured out and that being a part of the process of wooing someone and, and being involved in courtly love. Now, what's interesting about this, though, is when you connect it to the riddle from Sophocles' play, Shakespeare seems to be very comfortable with the idea of riddles and was definitely influenced by Sophocles to some degree because at the grammar school there in Stratford-upon-Avon where William Shakespeare was educated, Greek and Roman tragedies were popular textbooks for the students there. And Sophocles, along with Terence and several others, were writers that it's expected Shakespeare would have studied. Now, I don't think we have actual lists. We may. I haven't checked into curriculum lists for King Edward VI grammar school, but I do know that writers like Terence and Sophocles were what Shakespeare was reading in grammar school. So he would have been exposed to these stories and had this knowledge when he was including these references in his plays. And we see riddles as well as the Sphinx show up in several places for William Shakespeare. One of the places riddles show up is the quote, you have not the book of riddles about you, have you? This is Slender asking simple in the Merry Wives of Windsor. Now, according to an article from the Folger Shakespeare Library, riddles were a standard feature in several public works from the 16th century, as they say in their article, Riddles and Enigmas from 2016. Quote, as early as the 16th century, riddles were included in published anthologies, and they appear in print steadily. Now, I don't know if William Shakespeare knew about the Great Sphinx of Giza, though it had been exist it was in existence when he was writing. I don't know how much he knew about Egypt. Now, of course, Shakespeare's most famous Egypt play is Antony and Cleopatra, but it is in Twelfth Night that Shakespeare shows that Egypt might have had a reputation for riddles similar to the Sphinx. He has Feste say, quote, there is no darkness but ignorance in which thou art more puzzled than the Egyptians. So apparently there was a cultural association between Egypt and puzzles. Exploring the history of Shakespeare's relationship to the Egyptians and their reputation for being puzzled is for another episode. Now, it appears that for Shakespeare, there were actually a few versions of the Sphinx, but this particular mythological animal is different from the other ones that we've studied in this course up to now because there aren't all of these various branches out of it. You know, with the basilisk, you've got these people over here that think it has these traits, and you've got those people over there that think it has that trait. And with the Sphinx, it all seems to tie back to Oedipus the King and Sophocles' story in one way or another. There are some different versions of it that in Euripides wrote some, Homer wrote some, and the variations tend to be about what actually happens to Oedipus and his family and whether or not he dies or how he dies and whether or not he gets blinded and how he gets blinded and a few of the other characters in the story, exactly what happens to them varies from author to author, but the definition of a sphinx is pretty consistent. What's fun about going back and studying Sophocles and Euripides and Homer is that you see a lot of those narratives show up in Shakespeare's plays. In Sophocles' play, Oedipus blinds himself and is then exiled. His daughter Antigone acts as a guide, wanders through the country, and finally dies at Colonus, where they had been welcomed by the King Theseus of Athens. In Euripides' play, Oedipus is blinded by a servant, and that sounds a lot like Gloucester in King Lear to me. Oedipus's two sons are arranged to share the kingdom, and they each take turns sort of trying to rule it. This division among children about who's going to own the kingdom sounds a lot like King Lear as well. And albeit Shakespeare used daughters instead of sons. And also in Sophocles' play called Antigone, Creon had her buried in a rock cavern for defying him. And then in Euripides' version of Antigone, it appears that Antigone survives. That all sounds very similar to several turn of events that show up in Shakespeare's plays. And it makes it sound like if it's going to be proof of anything, it's proof that Shakespeare was well-read. He was influenced by a lot of Greek tragedy, which only makes sense for a professional to pay attention to what other people in his industry had done before him, which is who Sophocles and Terence were. They were theater writers in their time. You see other events from Antigone show up in the play Titus Andronicus, as well as Hamlet. At the end of Hamlet, Laertes and Hamlet both kill each other in a duel, leaving Fortinbras to be in charge of the kingdom, in the same way that the two brothers kill each other in Antigone, leaving Creon to be king. Now, not content to leave the relationship of Shakespeare to the Sphinx completely at a literary evaluation between 
you know, the text of Sophocles and the text of Shakespeare and how many literature references he could have been influenced by, I wanted to explore the actual history and context of the 16th century of the Sphinx. There's a man named George Sandys. He lived from 1578 to 1644. So his life overlapped with the life of William Shakespeare, even though he would be born after and live longer than William Shakespeare. He was a British antiquarian. And in 1610, this would be six years before William Shakespeare died, Sandys decided to travel to the Middle East for a year. And he published his travels in 1615. And he includes sketches of the pyramids. And you can see the Sphinx in the background of his drawing. And this sketch is of the pyramids and the Great Sphinx. It's dated 1610. And they think George Sandys actually drew this sketch. When he was drawing this sketch, he said, quote, aloft on a rocky level adjoining to the valley stands those three pyramids so universally celebrated. The name is derived from a flame of fire in regard of their shape, broad below and sharp above with a pointed diamond. By such, the ancient did express the original of things uniting all in the supreme head from whence all excellencies issue. And he goes on to add thoughts about the Sphinx specifically, saying, quote, not far off from these, the Colossus does stand, wrought all together into the form of an Ethiopian woman and adorned heretofore by the country people as a rural deity. The second drawing is a wood engraving of the inside of the Great Pyramids that comes from the second British explorer I want to tell you about. Now, the second British explorer came mostly after Shakespeare. Technically, he was born during Shakespeare's lifetime, but he was a teenager when Shakespeare died. So he wasn't necessarily going and doing this research during Shakespeare's lifetime because he would have been too young. But I feel like his writings are still relevant to our conversation. His name is John Greaves, and he was a scholar, and he was really obsessed with the great pyramids. And he was also really into a lot of ancient authors. And what's interesting about him and what influences me about understanding Shakespeare's perspective is that Greaves was also a mathematician and an astronomer. So you have to remember that for people like Shakespeare, all of these different disciplines went together. There was science and there was medicine and there was art and there was spirituality and religion and it, it all overlapped. They weren't definitively separate things the way we think of them today. One would influence the other. So please note, as I'm saying this, that it, it would have been impossible for these two British explorers to have influenced Shakespeare, even if Shakespeare had known about their writings and seen George Sandy's 1615 sketch that was published in England. I doubt very seriously that there's, I mean, I, I'm almost certain there's no reason to believe these archaeologists influenced Shakespeare, the places where he refers to the Sphinx and everything else happened well before these people did these explorations. But it does speak to the idea that a curiosity about the Sphinx, a curiosity about Egypt and an interest in this as a subject was present and very active, active enough for professionals to move themselves over to Egypt and explore it and report back to London during Shakespeare's lifetime. So I think that does inform what we understand about Shakespeare's Antony and Cleopatra, as well as what we can take away from the mentions to the Sphinx that we find in Shakespeare's play. There was one other kind of Sphinx that I found, and it is called an Aswan Sphinx. And this was developed by the Ptolemies. They were Greek Macedonians, and they borrowed a lot of the Egyptian symbols for their art. There is a bust in the British Museum, for example, that shows Ptolemy I Soter, the founder of the dynasty, and he's wearing this headdress of earlier pharaohs. And the Ptolemy, the Ptolemic Sphinx wears a particular symbol that is of the Egyptian cobra perched on a brow. And the uracis was used as a symbol of royalty and authority. The Sphinx included this carved necklace or a collar as well as a ceremonial beard. So when I branched out from my exploration of the Sphinx as purely an Egyptian sourced item to what other cultures in the 16th century or before might have been influencing the English understanding of the Sphinx, I found this one. So then I went back to Shakespeare's plays and searched, well, where can we find that? And interestingly, this particular Ptolemaic history of the Sphinx shows up in Antony and Cleopatra when Cleopatra says, quote, thou shouldst come like a fury crowned with snakes. 
It also shows up in the play As You Like It, where Oliver says, quote, about his neck, a green and gilded snake hath wreathed itself. So there seems to be some pervasive history of the Sphinx and Greek mythology throughout Shakespeare's plays, and not just in that one reference from Love's Labor's Lost. The Sphinx played a prominent role in European art during the Renaissance, and in a book from 1617, Michael Mayer stated that... The, he thought the solution to the Sphinx's riddle was actually the Philosopher's Stone. He says, quote, Sphinx is indeed reported to have had many riddles, but this offered to Oedipus was the chief. What is that which in the morning goeth upon four feet, upon two feet in the afternoon, and in the evening upon three? What was answered by Oedipus is not known, but they who interpret concerning the ages of man are deceived. For a quadrangle of four elements are of all things first to be considered. From thence we come to the hemisphere having two lines, a right and a curve, that is, to the white luna, from thence to the triangle which consists of body, soul, and spirit, or soul, luna, and mercury. Hence, Rossius in his epistles, the stone, says he, quote, is a triangle in its essence, a quadrangle in its quality. This is very interesting to me. I did a thesis paper on the calculus of Ben Jonson's Volpone, and we looked at things like the quadrangle and the triangle and the tetrad and the association of that with things like the meter and rhyme of Ben Jonson's Volpone. While I haven't had a chance to really delve into Shakespeare's plays at that level for this kind of meter and rhyme and numerology and application of some of Pythagoras' theories, this quote from Michael Mayer suggests that there was that kind of conversation going on about numbers and the association of things like the Sphinx and this Philosopher's Stone, as well as Oedipus's answer and what that means about humanity and the ages of man. All of that was sort of wrapped up together in the collective consciousness when Shakespeare was writing some of these things. Worth mentioning in terms of artwork that displayed the Sphinx was Raphael from the years 1515 to 1520, which is before Shakespeare, right? By about 30 years, because Shakespeare was born in 1564. So actually that's even more. That's like 50, almost 60 years before William Shakespeare was even born. Raphael was drawing some of these things. Um, so there was also a lot of 15th century French artwork that's featured what's called the French Sphinx, which is basically like the one in Egypt, but it's a, a woman and she has like earrings and pearls and whatever. That existed. Um, I felt like that was worth noting. I don't have any reason to think that was influencing Shakespeare, but it might have. I thought it was interesting to the time period. But irregardless, whether it's artwork or literature or these British archaeologists or even some of like Michael Mayer who wrote right after Shakespeare died about his association of the Sphinx with this Philosopher's Stone, almost all of these renderings allude to Oedipus's tale. So in terms of what was influencing William Shakespeare, it seems he was mostly influenced by Sophocles and Homer and possibly Euripides. Um, in terms of what he was looking at to draw on his stories and plot lines for his plays and in his use of the Sphinx. When it comes to the connection of the Sphinx to Egypt and then the logical connection to the pyramid, there is a large, and I mean involved, history to be explored that touches on Pythagoras, numerology, the four humors, and even the Freemasons, which one writer I came across in researching this week's episode suggests even had Shakespeare being involved in American colonization based on this association between the symbol for the Freemasons, which is a pyramid, and the pyramids that you see um, associated with the Sphinx. I feel like that's mm, bordering on conspiracy theory right there, but... I'm open-minded enough to say that I don't know, I suppose. All of that are topics that you can use to explore this further. As always, there's a ton more history behind this episode, including links to all of the resources I used to put together this lesson that you can download from the show notes. You do have to sign up to be an email subscriber to get the links to all of my resources and stuff that I use to research this, but that's awesome because then you get to start your week every Monday with Shakespeare because that's when I send out my emails is every single Monday. It has links to new episodes and content, including episodes just like this one. Phone's going off, so I should stop talking now. I will see you guys next Saturday. Thank you so much for being here. If you are interested in supporting the work we do here, consider becoming a member. Like I said, there's a whole lot more history that goes along with this, and we talk about it beyond the episode inside the membership area. So if you would like to learn more, or if you're writing a book or a paper or working in a theater and you want connections with other Shakespeareans as you work on your work in Shakespeare, consider becoming a member and come chat with us. You can find out more about that at castacash.com slash member. I'll see you next week.
Bye-bye.